Hello everybody, welcome to another Valheim video. Today we're going to be chatting with Valadriel the Mad, who is a modder. So I am excited to learn more about, uh, let's call it OG Valheim modding, with Valadriel. How's it going? Hello, I am Valadriel the Mad. So, so tell us a bit about, um, I, I guess let's start with, how did you get from playing Valheim to then getting into mods? Could you tell us a bit more about that process? Yeah, I mean, uh, the guy that I would uh, actually thank for that is actually a really good friend of mine. His name's Arfaroth. He's all over all kinds of video games. He's not much of a modder himself. Uh, but he he's played like over 300 games. That's a lot. It's insane. Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, so I actually met him uh, almost two years ago. It was October two years ago. I was playing V Rising. V Rising was the very first. Um, it was the very first survival game I ever played. I've always been into vampires, so I was just like, "This is great." Met him. He and I made really good friends, and since then we've been, you know, just you know how it is. Sometimes you just meet somebody online, and now you're playing every single game together forever. Um, and that's ultimately what happened. It's like the very first game that he recommended as soon as we were done with Revi with V Rising was Valheim. And he'd had this uh, vanilla server, you know, that he'd been running from home with a couple of friends for a few years. And I just remember spending my very first week of Valheim, spending an entire weekend just mining <laughs> copper ore. <laughs> that, that, was, that, that was my very first experience with the game. And I was just like... As strangely fun as this is, there has to be a better there has to be a better way to do this. And then he actually turned me on to modding, which he never does himself, but he told me about modding. I've been a lifelong gamer. I never modded a game in my entire life. Valheim was the first one, and then from there, yeah, I just kind of went crazy. Now every single video game that I play, I mod to the point that I create like completely new video games out of them. It, it, uh, I've done it for Project Zomboid, I've done it for Baldur's Gate 3, and uh, Valheim's just the game that I keep coming back to over and over and over again. Yeah, that's awesome to hear. I, I like thinking of them as ROM hacks. ROM as, hacks. As what? Sorry? Like, have you played a Pokemon ROM hack? Ah, it, no, it, I haven't. That's exactly what you're talking about. Like, people who really love Pokemon get together and then they work with communities of people who love Pokemon and then they literally like make a, a, a ROM that you can put on an emulator and play a, a, a modded version oh. of Pokemon Blue or, or Pokemon Crystal. Oh, that yeah. is and very it's cool. Awesome. I, I used to think sort of eh about these things. I thought they were really like gimmicky, but I realized that's just the judgment. Y yeah, some of them are like they don't break. They break. You can't play them reliably, etc. Whereas other ones, uh, and I've learned now, it's the ones that are developed by communities versus individuals. But the ones developed by communities, they're really polished. And like they often just go for the gameplay experience. And it's almost like they make a version of the game that is more of itself. It's like it found its confidence. You know, it, like, it, it, it's amazing. What you're describing is exactly what I want to build. You know, it, it's what I've been trying to build in uh, Valheim for a long time. You know, I've run several servers, some for myself, some for other people. And uh, and it's like, you know, there's always like that. It, initially, there there's always that excitement for like a new world and a new game. But I always found that within like 30 days, about half of your group just kind of tapers off. And and, and, uh, and I, really, one, the biggest reason that I'm here is to try and solve that problem, right? To try to actually create a solid, consistent group of players that really just want to delve into a world. Yeah, that's together. a great transition. So for any of you listening, he's, he's looking for other people who want to join these projects, whether it's as a player or maybe without modding these things. So keep that in mind as you're listening to this conversation because you will be able to interact and if this is something you are interested in. Um, but before we get into the nitty gritty of that, what I would like to address is what you just mentioned about why Valheim tends to taper off after a month because if we can really get into this and help people understand the mechanical aspects of why that happens um, it helps give people ideas on how to make servers last longer and there's a lot I could get into about that but for now I'd like to ask you what, what, oh, yeah. what do you think 
Valheim does. What about Valheim makes it so that most players leave after that initial, let's call it the early game. After the early game ends, which I'd say is like swamp after that, maybe after mountains, depending on how you look at it. But the uh, after mountains is usually when the drop off happens, probably because mountain has the coolest looking gear. <laughs> yeah, so you would you would say that it's around that era. Yeah, it, it, it's typically after mountain that you start to see people kind of taper off of the servers. And yeah, I mean, I could say there's a lot of reasons for it. I'd say that number one. Valheim struggles from the same problem that V Rising and a lot of other survival games do. And it's that I think ultimately it it pulls in a lot of people that are like classic RPGers into the game, right? Or or, or people, you know, if you're not coming from a survival background, if you're coming from like an RPG background or more of an MMO background, you know, when the game yeah. ends, the game ends. So, you know, right now you get to the end, you kill Fader, and it's like, okay, the game's over. So it's like you know, the funnest thing that most people can do at that point is just re-roll a new world, right? Unless you're super dedicated to just, like, building out and exploring every single inch of the world. But I've just never met someone that actually wants to do that. Yeah, it's a minority. So that's kind of problem yeah. people, number one. People form attachment yeah. to the same world that makes them no longer immersed. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly. And then... you. Kind of like the other problem that you run into, in my opinion, is that, see, I really love game design. And one of the things that I, right now, I, I own a marketing business. And in the future, uh, you know, I, I imagine retiring and just making video games all the time. And I, so I listen to a lot of podcasts and I, and I, and I read a lot of articles from people that are actual game devs. And one of the things that they talk about in every single game is the, uh, is essentially what, what is your a cycle? What is your gaming cycle? What is this? What is the repetitive thing that your player is going to do over and over and over again when they play the game, right? And that's step number one. And then step number two is how do I mask that? How do I not get them to realize that they're doing the exact same pattern repeatedly so that they stay immersed or in the game? Or make it so fun they don't care. Um, and in Valheim, yeah, exactly. And in Valheim, it's, it's, you know, with most survival games, it's pretty simple. Go out, kill stuff grab materials, come back to base, build stuff. That's the cycle over and over again. And one of the ways that I tried to kind of break that cycle in my video, in, in sorry, in my modded Valheim runs was really with my first mod, which was Vladerals Bad NPCs. Where what I did was I took RRR Core uh, by Neurodome. Never met that guy, but thank that guy, but I, I thank that person to death because without him I would have never made my first mod. And then I take, uh, and then I took Melderson's All Tameable, who helps me all the time. By the way, Melderson is a fantastic person in the community for people to, uh, for people to go to if they have questions. I just kind of mesh those two things together, and I took my love of Lord of the Rings and and Dungeons and Dragons and fantasy, and it was just like, you know what? I'm going to put elves in this game. I'm going to put dwarves in this game, sirens, dryads, the whole nine. Also, big shout out to Fantu. Uh, he created Pop Villagers, which was kind of like Pop Villagers is really where I got the original idea for this because that's where I really saw what RR Core was capable of. And then from there, I was just like, you know what? Let me take RR, let me take All Tameable, let me create like a crazy complex breeding system, and let's force players to not just let, let's break up the cycle where now the game isn't just about you know gathering resources and then building your base. The game is also now about uh, essentially gathering allies, creating communities for them, breeding them so that you can create more powerful allies that can then come with you on adventures. It's just kind of just make it so that each biome takes that much longer to get through because the people on your server understand that a part of this game is we have to build a community for the elves. We have to build a community yeah, for the dwarves. You know, sense. we have to. You know, we have, we have to tame the sirens and then create an army to fight the sirens that are always up against us whenever we're swimming in the ocean. And that was that was my idea in a nutshell. Uh, you bring up a great great point at the end there. Uh, it's actually something I was going to point out about Valheim, is that it, it in order to really last, for the experience to be long term, uh, other people need to be involved, basically. and building is a fundamental part of that um but there's pr 
problems with Valheim because the game itself doesn't really give you much reason to build. You don't spawn a boss by building a certain kind of building with at least you know a certain amount of stone in it or something. Mm -hmm. uh, these aren't integrated into the game. So, in, in from my perspective, the the reason that well, like you said, there's many reasons, but the the dominating reasons for why people stop playing Valheim have to do with this mentality that is common throughout the game where you find something once and move on. Uh, the, the game doesn't have very many mm -hmm. item sinks. It doesn't have very many consumables. The boss system is tiered. So you kill a boss once, move on, you're done with that biome for the most part. Maybe you need some carrots or raspberries or something, but you're done, you know? And, and that, that's, actually, that's actually one of the things that I tried to immediately address with, uh, with my Mad NPCs mod, and, uh, and that they still address it to this day. So, like, for instance, uh, one of the things that I built into it was, I don't want you having access to my mages or my druids or any of my magical characters until magic becomes a part of the game, which is after yeah. you kill Gag. So, so what I've done is, you know, for instance, if you want a druid, you know, an elven druid, well, after you kill Yagnuth, you're going to have to go back to the Black Forest and you're going to have to go hunting for them. So, so I'm trying to give players a reason to go back to, to the different biomes as they progress. And I've kind of created, you know, using global keys, those, the, those little kind of incentives throughout, uh, throughout the entire mod. Uh, but again, this is all assuming that you're super into all of the different races and breeding, which I, I'm not even sure if, if everyone is. Because um, I'm mostly just kind of building this in the dark and, you know, changing and iterating based yeah, off Yeah, it's still I one way. It's sort of like... I imagine it's sort of like a, one of those whirlwinds or something where things all lead towards a similar place. So ideally, when we adjust games, we do it in a way where different people can do different things, but they sort of get directed in similar ways anyway. Um, but it, it's obviously Correct. challenging to do that without playtesting. Basically, the only way you can do it is to do something and then have people play it and you observe what they do. And then you understand how the people who aren't you, who are very different from you, you understand how they play. But that circumstance is really challenging for people to produce where you can like make, a, make an update to your mod and then just update it and then get people playing it like immediately. You know, so usually there's delays and it's hard to find mm -hmm. players in these things. So that, that's one of the reasons that um, EWP modding is so crazy because it, it's done like live on the server while the players are, are there. So you can literally just like a player can ask, they can be like, ah, I really wish this would happen. Like for example, um, recently a player, I have a couple players on Palm and they're, they're, they're probably listening actually. Uh, uh, Teensy, I'll share a bit of your story. So they, basically there are these players who, they love building, that's what they do, they build. And for the most part, they don't do that much exploration and the other mechanisms of the game. And these players often just, mm -hmm. the first two biomes really are the vast majority of their play experience and they're comfortable with that. But the problem is that they need other people playing in the world who are exploring and interested. And because of the nature of things, those other people leave and then these builders feel like, well, what's the point now? No one's here doing anything, right? Yeah. You know you're hitting on another great point that I've noticed from managing different different servers. And it's that everyone it's kind of interesting. To me, the best Valheim servers are the ones where everyone ends up fitting a different role, right? Or where you have pairs of people that are yeah. filling different roles. Because I'll often find that I'm always the guy that's back at base building and farming. You know, there's always like two guys out exploring, bringing back, bringing back resources. And it's not that I wouldn't love to be out there exploring. It's just that they're always bringing back so many resources. Somebody's got to organize everything and make sure that the that the base is running smoothly. So I, I honestly think that Valheim groups tend to work best when you've got like a group of say somewhere between four to six players. Each one of them has like slightly different interests, like slightly different reasons that they're playing the game, but they all ultimately work together and just fit yeah. different roles. Like not only does not only has that been like the longest experiences that I ever had in the games with folks, but they're honestly they tend to be the funnest because people focus on the aspect of the game that they love the most. Like my buddy Arf, 
he just loves to go out there and murder things. I, I, I think he's a sociopath in a, in a previous life or something, but he just wants to murder things. So he's perfectly fine with me. Yeah, that, that, that's common. People seem to often have a preference that way. And so, so I'll, I'll share, share what I was getting at. So these builders, they, they often actually want to explore and see some of the more dangerous biomes and stuff. But the Valheim is tuned in a way that, that it starts and it gives you this awesome safe meadows. But then you never really get that again. Like you can, you can find a meadows that's next to a swamp, find a meadows that's near a mountain, near a plains. But when it comes to finding meadows near Mistlands or finding meadows near Ashlands, these for the most part aren't, aren't much of a thing, right? So there is a, a lack of safe space in the later part of the game and the mid part of the game that makes it challenging for players to explore. So what we did basically is we made it so now there's these like mini safe bunkers that a player can make if there isn't one already in the area. So they go, they explore, they find a spot they like, they toss like, they build a portal and then they toss some wood into the portal and it literally builds a blueprint for them. So like it builds the thing wow. around them and then that way uh, you can like inset it into the ground so they get basically a cubby that they can then improve upon so it's just really simple it doesn't have any that, like workbench extensions or anything like that it's just a bed a box that is ridiculously cool I want access to that <laughs> yeah, video. Yeah. well that's the thing about <laughs> these things they're all just scripts like it's not like with the mods where you have to download and have your players download and that element i know it seems like it's not that important from like a modding perspective but from the like the socio psychological game dev perspective, that part of it makes it so much easier to get people play testing your stuff. They don't have to download anything; they just have to already be on your server, and you can just subject them to things. And as long as they have fun, they'll stick around. And that creates this environment that makes it so much easier to um, get people involved with your modding. Uh, the the people on the server, for yeah, example. This is a whole new, yeah. This is a whole new kind of modding that I've actually haven't experienced at all. It's actually a great segue into what we were talking about before about like essentially like the four different types of modding. Yeah, exactly. And do you want to tell them? Because you told me that, but do you want to tell them what you were? So we were talking earlier, and you mentioned that there's sort of like sort of categories. Uh, yeah, sure. So, so yeah. So like one of the things that I've noticed, you know, after two years of just kind of being the Thunderstore page every single day and talking to a lot of different people on my server and also just, you know, communicating with different modders is that there, I really kind of break up the Valheim community into four different groups. Um, the first group is what I like to call the true modders, you know, the guys like Melderson, Azumat, Horum, you know, Chubb, you know, yeah. the, the guys that are in there, uh, they know how to code, they're in there every single day, they're creating amazing new stuff on Unity, um, you know, the, thank God for those people. And then you've got the second kind of group of modders, which is me, which is the people that take the amazing tools that these guys create, and then put them all together in some kind of amalgamation to create like a brand new kind of playable experience. And then the th and then group number three I break up into two, which is the users, the people who like to use mods in their game. And really, it's kind of two two groups there. Group number one is the people who just want things to work. They're not necessarily interested in community. They're going to download your mod so they can create like their own world on their own, and uh, you know and do their thing and be done with it. And then you've got the other group of people, which I think is probably a lot of people that play Valheim, that they wish that they knew how to mod, but the whole thing is just really, really intimidating to them and they don't know where to start. And part of the whole reason that I came on here was I would love to see more modders in, in the community. And you know, I, I, I just want to tell folks, look, I'm a layman. I don't know anything about coding. And I was, so far, I've been able to put together three pretty well-reviewed uh, and, and downloaded mods just using the tools that a lot of these other folks have made. And it's not because I'm, I'm a genius. It's because they've made it that easy. Like, my advice to folks is if you're intimidated about modding, step one, I, I tell people, do things the way I did it. Look at tools that you have available to you. 
right? See if you can learn how to use those tools on your own. Just kind of apply yourself because I can tell you it's going to be astronomically more difficult to figure out to try and how to do coding on your own. So do this first, right? See, see if you even enjoy it. See if you have a knack for it. See if this is something that you want to do. And then, and then if you want to keep going from there, contact the guys like Melderson and Horam. And, you know, a lot of them are willing to teach and they're, and they're willing to help and, I would just love to see a lot more, a lot more of the incredibly creative people that are like, for instance, inside of my Discord every single day, giving me recommendations for my mod. I would love to see these people making their own mods that I can then incorporate into my game. Because, because honestly, this is to me, this is what makes Valheim such an incredibly fun and engaging game. It's like the the building squared element of Valheim. <laughs> You build buildings, but then instead of just building buildings, you build things that build things that people can use to build things. You know, you keep <laughs> keep going up. And, and, you, uh, and what you end up building in the process yeah. is worlds. And like, you know, I'm a dungeon master. I, I, like, I love D&D. &D. Building worlds is just my, it's it's like, it's just what I do. Like I, uh, I truly have a passion for this. I literally wake up in the middle of the night sometimes with like solutions to problems. <laughs> and, I, and, I, and I rushed to my computer to, to fix them and immediately publish the new mods. As a matter of fact, I wanted to thank you. I recently watched uh, that video that you put out about the uh, fuelings uh, at yeah. night. Um, the, the fact that they were always set on hunt. Dude, it was like a light bulb went off in my head. For years, people have been complaining about how hard it is to tame my uh, enemy NPCs in the game. And watching your video, it finally dawned on me. It's because I had them all set to hunt. <laughs> yeah. So I immediately fixed the I literally made this change earlier today. It's the change that I made <laughs> that I made to, to the NPCs mod earlier today. And it works. Now now they're not constantly aggroing every two seconds after you feed them. And I was just like, a problem that I've been thinking about in my head for years. How do I fix this? What's the issue? And the only reason I was able to figure it out was because I watched a random YouTube video from someone yeah, in the Yeah, that's, that's how it works. It really is. Uh... The, about a subject that was completely unrelated. <laughs> it, it's almost like we don't get things done because we're actually getting in our own way. And so when we're thinking too much, we tend to not be able to notice simpler things. So we have to stop the thinking and let ourselves just have experiences. And then those experiences show us exactly what to do. So, so it's actually easier. <laughs> yeah, it, yeah it, it, it's also the natural pro problem that you run into when you're trying to mash 100 mods together and make them work. Yeah. <laughs> as, as well, like you, you, you're, gonna, you're gonna run into issues, which is one of the things that I'm doing with this, uh, with this new world that I'm trying to put together. I've been working on it for about a month now, just getting every single configuration for every single mod to work you know it's almost about 100 mods and uh and you know i really want to create a long-standing world that attracts a lot of builders particularly fantasy builders you know people that really look forward to the idea of you know i want to rebuild rivendale from yeah. the lord of the rings right or or i want to create uh one of the larger cities from the witcher which that's that, that's that's that would be impressive <laughs> and uh i might put that so, on my bucket list so maybe we can pick um, this subject a little bit is there is there could i could i share something about this it, I, I think it'll be useful to you yeah sure so something i've noticed it's a recurring mistake that a lot of people make whether it's with mods or building um that the important thing to remember is that the enjoyable experience for the builder is the act of planning and building the thing. The moment it is finished, mm -hmm. it loses all gameplay value, pretty much. So this is a really yep. important reality to keep in mind because when one wants to make a repeatable experience that is enjoyable for builders, it has to be done in a way where there is a lot to build but people that, that like that sounds obvious I, right I, I but people yeah. no i completely agree with you completely from my own experience i literally spent a week 
building my perfect base like two weeks ago. Uh, I was just like, you know what? I'm going to put on dev commands. I'm going to have all the building materials, and I want to build my perfect my, my my perfect base. I built the whole thing in like a in like a three day period. I think it took like twelve hours, and and I'm done with it. And I'm like, oh, this is great. I've got all of my storage in one area. I've got I've got max comfort over here. You know, my kitchen looks amazing. I got, I got all these cool crafting stations. I got my entire farming and breeding system completely automated. And then as soon as I was finished building everything, and then I and then I saved everything to plan build, I was immediately bored, and I stepped away from the game for like <laughs> yeah. two days. And that that's exactly what I'm describing, except even on a a larger scale. Because when when we build mm-hmm. servers, we're basically building things, building buildings for other people. And it's really common for a server to be overbuilt. And then people get confused why builders don't want to use the things. But th- that's, that's the most important part. So if you want to attract people to your project, it needs to be in a way where you make the experience itself about building the cities, not building everything so you can then release it and people can play. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely, and that's that's really the the goal. You know, uh, another another thing that I've kind of noticed is so you've got like the forever Valheim servers, and I'm really tempted to hop into one of those forever vanilla servers and just uh, it, it, you know just to have that experience of jumping into a world. No worries. Sorry about that. Of jumping into a world that um, you know was has been like heavily played through by you know by um, by a lot of folks. And, uh, uh, you know, just kind of walking through it and adding some of my own flair to it. And, and, and that and that does sound like fun. But I think that, like, even in, even in, like, a long-term world like I'm trying to build, I think one of the things that players need to be realistic about what they enjoy about the game and what they don't enjoy about the game. And I think that a truly forever server doesn't really serve most players because eventually you beat fader and then it's exactly what we described yeah. right so I, I i think the real key i think the real key to creating a server that has real longevity is one you got to get buy-in from everyone right like no one's going to jump ahead on biomes everyone's going to be on the same page like like site one two and three needs to be built before the group moves on to the next thing that we're doing and then lastly, there needs to be the realistic uh, expectation that we're probably going to wipe the server at some point, whether that point is six months from now, a year from now, or even two years from now, depends on the group, right? But I think that also has to be like a realistic part of the experience because to what you're saying, let's say that we build out the whole thing and then we, you know, we try to re-release the server. You're right. That's not going to work. What's going to work and what's going to make the players come back is if you start a, ser- a new server from scratch and now they're building all over again. Yeah. Is it so, so I'll bring up one, one thing. What you were talking about earlier about the, the kind of roles that people go into when they play Valheim and they make, like a, let's say, a group of like five or six people. There'll be some builders, some combat people, some people who do more organizing, some people who do nothing and take everything from everyone else and cause problems, some people who do everything for everyone, right? There's all these different archetypes. So mm-hmm. what I'll, I'll try and suggest to you is that that is actually just the constitution of one playgroup. And that for a server to actually be alive, like what you just said, that vanilla thing, that can't work. Like literally, it can't stay alive forever in most cases. Um, at, at least not without lots of period mm-hmm. with no players, right? Like, most of the time, there's almost no players on a, a server that functions that way. People join, they explore a little bit for one or two sessions, and then they leave. They don't come back. So what, what, I'm, what I was getting at is that what you can imagine is that imagine each playgroup as one player. So you have to make a world in a way where different eras and different playgroups can come through leave their imprint upon the world and whatever the theme of that session and that time was and then that play group leaves but another one comes in and has some kind of different experience maybe building somewhere else on the world so the 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 reality of how to make a valheim server that stays alive for multiple years 
has to function that way. It has to somehow be made in a way where the players come, they play in their groups, their pairs, their solos, their duos naturally, and maybe there's one play group in one area in the mid game, another play group in the beginning, and just a couple stragglers from a plevi- previous playthrough. But the problem, obviously, as you can imagine, is that Valheim itself gets in the way of that happening. The locations don't reset, the materials no. don't reset, the boss progression system is completely linear. So there's all of these things that Valheim does that stop that. So I, I totally understand what you're saying when you say that it has to be wiped at some point, because that's a lot easier to do. But the, the problem is when builders know that, it's going to get wiped at some point, they feel less interested in world building. Like, the, that's what the, 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 the cat yeah. is. You have to basically have people feel that what they're doing is going to be used while the reality is the vast majority of what people make doesn't get used. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm with you. My only counter to that would be the builders. Look into the mod called Better Creative. I'm sorry, not not better creative. Uh, plan uh, yeah. <laughs> save save everything that you build and love, and then just re and then just replant it in new worlds. Yeah, people they they definitely use and plan it works. Build. Like- um, but it, it's more. I'm just saying the that's just how the psychology of the players work. Like they. No, I I, I understand. But. But that's uh, that's that, that's. You know, my, I say the same thing to my best friend all the time, too, because, you know, right now he's, like, building a base in the mountains. And I'm like, okay, build it, and then plan build it, and we can bring it into our new world. And he's like, I don't want to do that. I want to start rebuilding from scratch. And I'm like, okay, then do that. But, it, yeah, it definitely seems to me that uh, most players aren't like me. Like, I like to build, save it in plan build. Maybe, you know, everything that I've ever made, I have in a plan, I have in a plan build file. Maybe one day I'll learn how to how to fully use like the world edit tools and start populating them into the world. I haven't quite made up my mind, but you know, the one thing that I do love about, you know, that mod in particular is that it, it gives us the ability to, to, to save our stuff, even if yeah, we destroy our world. It's incredible. And cause I'm constantly just like destroying one world yeah, after another. Yeah, so especially if you get into messing with the values and things, it's, it's very easy to like screw up the world generation somehow or delete all these objects. And that's where that, it's like sometimes, sometimes you just don't want to use the genlock command, and you just want to see how it'll generate the world from, you know, how the game will actually generate with all of the mods that yeah. you put in from the deck. <laughs> That's almost a game in itself. <laughs> so, yeah, so, I mean, I, I spend probably ninety percent of my time just mods. So why don't we now move on to the project that you're working on? Um, so I have the the document that you sent earlier. Could you could you tell us a little bit about basically it looks like you're trying you really want to find other people who are passionate about this kind of thing. So I'm trying to figure out like how can I make that clear to people listening so that if one of them feels the way you do about what you're about to explain that they can come and just interact with you or talk to you or get involved. Yeah, for sure. So I'm looking for honestly anywhere between two to four players who would love to come in and create a long-term kind of fantasy slash RPG themed building server. You know, I want, you know, folks who want to come in here, they want to build beautiful things, they want to be thematic. Most importantly, I'm looking for people that really want to come together and like work as a team, and like really have that experience. You know, my background was, you know, I'm an old school World of Warcrafter. Right, that that's where I started. I used to manage, you know, several twenty-five man raids. You know, I, I had several guilds. I used to also run battlegrounds. You know, and, and the one kind of like every video game that I've ever played, every gaming community that I've ever gone into, I've tried to kind of rebuild the community that one experiences playing WoW. Because when you're managing like twenty-five people who are literally playing with each other three to four nights a week. Like, it really is a unique experience, just like having all of these people come together, having a singular goal, right? And that's really what I want from almost every game that I play. But there are very few games where that's possible. 
Valheim's one of the games where that is possible. But one of the things that I've learned um, is that there seems to be like a weird generational gap when it comes to gaming, right? You know, I'm 37 years old. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a millennial. And it seems like folks in my generation really love the idea of gaming communities. We are social gamers. You know, we were the, we were the original uh, MMO generation. You know, gaming for us was a highly social event. But one of the things that I've, that I've realized from a lot of the younger uh, players, not just of this game, but of almost every game that I go into, you know, Gen Zs, Gen A types, is that they're incredibly antisocial. They, they want to play games by themselves. They don't have any interest in any of the social aspects of the games. And I think that, like, one of the things, that, you know, especially since these are the kind of people who grew up playing Minecraft, Valheim is exactly the kind of game that these people would love. Right, and it's also the kind of game that uh, that lends itself to the kind of MMO kind of or RPG style community of past games that I think is really missing from a lot of games nowadays, and I think would be just beneficial to a lot of people who, you know, if you're the kind of person who's gaming constantly, you know, I, I don't want to preach to the choir here, but your mental health will be a lot better if you do it with friends than if you're doing it by yourself. Yeah, I mean. I guess it depends on your friends, to be honest, because people use that word loosely. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get, we'll get better friends. <laughs> but I, 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 I agree with you about that in the sense that, like, the, the ways one is playing and the things one's doing, like, there's a huge difference between, like, being involved with, uh, with people on a server and helping them and trying to build something and talking to other people about their needs and stuff and managing that versus clicking a button, joining a InstaQued dungeon and then doing a role that's predetermined that's all about you just having gear checks. Like I, I'm, I am somebody who, I, I absolutely loved World of Warcraft back before people were mm -hmm. mass educated about it and back before it um, it became what yeah. it became. But, so so I, I agree, but yeah, I see that it's it's very complicated. Like there's there's a lot of problems that that dynamic that you reference of people raiding and like they were there to have fun, but at least in these days, if you play World of Warcraft and you're in a raiding guild um, and you prioritize fun, <laughs> you're not treated very well. Like mo that's the reality, right? Yeah. I yeah, I left, I left World of Warcraft in 2013. Not because I was tired of the toxic community, because I had two raid groups. You know, I had the hardcore group with the yeah. kind of guys that you described. And then I had, you know, the more casual group where, you know, we played on our alts and we were just uh, having fun. But honestly, what broke the game for me was the, was the casual gameplay experience with Cataclysm. When they made, when they made raid queuing so simple that it made... That, it, that essentially made hardcore raiding obsolete in the game. That's when I checked out and I never came back. Yeah, one of hundreds and hundreds of ways that they have uh, created a circumstance of profit over player enjoyment. So. <laughs> yeah, which is, which is you know, another thing that we have to say about Valheim that is amazing. You know, Stone, Stone Prophet mentioned it in his interview with you. That's absolutely true. Twenty dollars for this game? I feel like I'm stealing yeah. from these people. I have spent over two thousand hours modding their game, much less much less playing. Uh, I'm just like honestly, they could ask for a lot more, and I think the community would pay a lot more. This game is a hundred percent worth it. For I, I can't. Uh, there's only probably only three or four other games that I can think of where you get this kind of bang. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I think pe people get distracted because there's always going to be people online complaining. Um, but the reality is, I mean, I'm, I'm in the same boat. I have thousands of hours in Valheim. I've made content about it. It pays for like a portion of my rent because I make YouTube videos. And it's not like I earn like a lot of money from it, but it helps. It makes my life easier. And I'm very, very lucky to be able to do that. And it's all... You know, as, as, as a marketer, too, one of the things that I absolutely love about the current gaming and modding environment is, and I'm sure you've seen this pattern over and over again, games get really, you know, so many games go on early access, right? Uh, and then really the modding community steps in 
makes the game so much better. A lot of the times, the studios then recruit the modders who made their game better. And it's like, so, it, it, I love how it's, uh, the, the, big, the big change, I think, what, what I'm trying to get at in, like, the gaming world is that 10 years ago, what we're doing right now just wasn't possible. Right? Like, you couldn't create mods that were, like, a la carte and other people could just, like, quickly learn how to use them so that you could, so that you could modify a game. Um, but that's the direction that we're going in. And it seems to me that, like, this is the general future of gaming. I don't think the future of gaming is going to be in these big, you know, projects like Bethesda or Dragon Age, which is coming out at the end of this month and is absolutely one of my favorite game series and I cannot wait for it. But I, I think the future of gaming is actually more indie projects like this it, it, it's more amateurs like like you and me coming together and creating and cr creating games especially as the as the tools the ai tools come out that just make this easier yeah. and easier and easier you know I, I was an early adopter of chat gpt and i can tell you ju just from seeing the way that the technology is going in the very near future Almost any of us is going to be able to make whatever game that we want with a couple of prompts. And I think the future of gaming is going to be these little online communities of passionate people like us coming together, sharing ideas, and, and creating games that we love that are true passion projects. And I think that in the end, those games are going to completely crowd out the for-profit market. Yeah, I mean, who knows? Gaming is a big, it's a big industry, so there's enough room for everybody, so to speak. But... It, that the AAA scene is notorious for that. It, I mean, it's not a new thing. The since gaming was a thing, it is marketed into oblivion, exploded and crashed, and then slowly, it becomes normal for games to be so horrible that whenever there is a good game, it stands out so much that it basically gets free marketing. So it produces a circumstance. All the shittiness produces a circumstance where the things that aren't like that. Mm -hmm become increasingly more obvious and increasingly more likely to pop off and establish new industry standards. But it's just, we haven't, yeah, yeah. I get where you're, I get what you say when you say that that hasn't, when you, like you refer to that that hasn't happened. And especially with a game like Valheim, like the, the reality is that mm -hmm. it was sort of cursed by the, the way that it got popular was too early. It wasn't ready for it yet and too many people learned about Valheim, and now they think they know what Valheim is. And that's a problem, because they don't. They had an experience while it was in development. Yeah, I, I, but that's not... I blame... I actually blame the studio for this a little. Um, they've just taken away... It, this game has been on early access for so long, right? It's. It, I think Project Zomboid kind of suffers from the same problem. But it's like... It, 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 when you when you're when a game is that unpolished when it first releases, right? You're gonna lose probably half of your player base very very quickly, and there are very few people like you and me that really have this kind of like staying power. They're gonna stick with a game for oh for God knows how I long. Mean, it's to, to, to it's see not it like I don't take fruition. breaks from Valheim. I definitely do. I can't just you know. Well, yeah, I, yeah. I, I think that was their mistake. Ultimately, yeah. it's like yeah, really. I, a lot of this early action really is experimental. I see what you're saying, like, but like at, the, the, at the same time, like mm -hmm. they had no, absolutely no idea that things were going to play out the way they did. Like hundreds of thousands of games get released on early access, and they just get a couple players. Yeah. Like the, there were, from my perspective at least, that the pandemic was unpredictable. There was no way they were going to know that their game was timed perfectly to become a vice at a time where a global pandemic was locking almost a billion people inside who wouldn't normally be inside. Like, talk about some circumstantial environmental effects, yeah, that's, right? That, 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 during COVID, I was building a marketing company, so like that never even occurred yeah. to me. <laughs> well, but, but that's the thing. We don't, well, I, we I, don't I, I, necessarily I, I, think about how these things affect for example, the psychology of the developers. Like, imagine that you're working mm -hmm. on a game, and of course, at first, that's so thrilling, all of that success and money and everything, but then what? Your game isn't finished, and no matter how much work mm -hmm. you put in, you know there is a chance 
it will never be that popular again. I'm not saying Valheim will never be as popular as it was. I, I'm just saying that that is a possibility given the fact that it became popular during a once in a lifetime, well, hopefully, <laughs> once in a lifetime circumstance where literally our government health agencies were telling people to go home and play video games. Like they were recommending that. Like that, that causes basically a bunch of it's it's hand-eye coordination, <laughs> yeah, okay? Yeah, right. <laughs> but that that effect it's very relevant to the Valheim situation because it basically made a bunch of I I, I don't mean to be offensive at all, but it's almost like an, an artificial Valheimer. They were playing Valheim, but not for the sake of Valheim. Not for the game that Valheim is. More so, it was. They, they were exactly. doing it out of. It was just the game your friends were playing. It's just another game to play with your friends, and so I, I'm under the impression, and again, I could be totally wrong about this, but I'm under the impression that the developers actually have had quite a hard time since then, um, especially if you look at them in interviews. Like they're so focused on the negative things, on the 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 comments that people get, and I I understand that. Um, but I can see, I can sense it, that they don't seem to understand just how incredible of a game that they've made. And for me personally, I think it's really, it, it's worth just pointing out that there, I can't even imagine what it would be like to, to go through the emotions they went through of that situation. And especially now, just look at the comments on their social media things when they release something. See how many of them are, like, positive. Yeah, it, Negative. it's... Negative? It's hard, and I, like we've been so cruel to them. Like as fans of their game, it's normal. <laughs> as as as, yeah, as as a marketing professional, you know, if I was working on their team, what I would actually tell them is just don't ever look at your social media ever. The only person in your organization that should ever look at your social media is your social media manager. Have your developers focused on developing, all right? Let let us like you know get through what's people trolling, what's people just being mean, and what, what's what's essentially that crowd of people that just want things to yeah. work, right? Like I, I always like to remind people, it's like, dude, there's a lot of people. Look, most people play video games, right? Most people are also really dumb. And they have absolutely no concept of how difficult it is to do any of this stuff. Even on the level that I'm doing it, I get so annoyed when people are like, oh, it's not working. Uh, be because it, it, it is working, you're, you're, you're just being dumb and you're not reading, okay? Because you just want things to work, you don't want to put forth any effort and read. And I think that at the end of the day, that's why you need to just ignore most of the negative comments. Like. You need to be able to identify what's constructive criticism versus someone just complaining. Someone just complains. Yeah, I but it, it's them, right. It's, but it's, if I'm it's getting, trickier than that, you know. Yeah, but if I'm getting constructive like criticism, yeah, if I'm it's getting, not like there's just some social media page they can turn off. You know, they went from uh, this is like a, a passion project one of them had, right? And then they got some other people involved, and then before they knew it, the whole world knows about their game, and is convinced they know the best way to do it. You know. And so like, that, that's why I, I just always try and be sympathetic to them because they're like, at the end of the day, like, yeah, even the things I've talked about, there's tons of things that I believe Valheim does that it can do better. But the only reason I've been able to even observe these things is because I can play Valheim, I have a server that people play on, and I can watch them. And none of that would be possible. I wouldn't understand these things if they hadn't made the game and if Yer hadn't made the mods that I use. Like the, the modding providers you've made, uh, everything I've done is with Yer's tools. So it's, it's exactly the same. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just so important that we acknowledge like the thing we love that they made, this experience we call Valheim, it did come from these people. It came from Iron Gate. Like, and we should acknowledge that while yes, we have improvements in these things. It, it really, especially given the price, they have done so much as far as I'm concerned. They could just slap a 1.0 on it and be like, you know, fuck it. And I would still love Valheim. It wouldn't change anything about how I feel just, about I just it. Let, let the modding community feel like <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's just <laughs> obviously that they would get a bunch of shit if they did that. But also, they're going to get a bunch <laughs> of shit for their Deep North update. 
we're going to blame them. We're yeah. going to attack them. We're going to criticize them. And it's going to be more of what they receive. And it's so yeah. sad. My, my, only, my only actual criticism towards them so far is why is the ocean empty? Well, it's not supposed to be. Ocean. Why do I have that, to? That's something that they'll, they'll add yeah. at some point. But I know, but it's like, okay. Literally for more than six years, people have been swimming through your oceans without anything to really worry about. I'm like, you guys could have well, fixed it's, this. Yeah, but that, that's, that's the time. thing. That, that's the mentality I'm talking about because, <laughs> yeah, yes, their ocean is empty and they haven't added that. But I would assume that that is because of other things that they did do, like the fact that they added crossplay. And obviously, you know, the networking thing is a whole other thing. But it's like, they seem to be functioning and they're a small team and they got totally overwhelmed with things and now we just want to like pick at them but really like we can't expect them to do anything differently they are the way they are like that that's that's you know, that's how it is there's no point in even having that's a gripe the only, that's the only bit that we're picking <laughs> on them about all right before they ever touch mislands Mish Land, they should have touched the ocean yeah i mean oh, I, right. I do see your point though priority wise like ultimately because it's a bottom that they're exposed early in the to game. yeah early exactly in the game. it's it's one of the first it's, it's the repeating experience the earlier yeah. that's that, that's that's my only main gripe you know the funny thing too is that like on the modded worlds that i always make it's something like 80 percent of the mods that i'm putting in are really just quality of life mods Better UI, build camera, AAA crafting, Sears catalog, stuff like that. And you know, I, I'd say that in terms of if I was gonna if I was gonna request that the devs really do anything to the mechanics of the game, it'd be looking at some of these quality of life issues, right? Like, I, I think yeah, they're actually they taking to, care like... of the of AAA crafting with uh, with the next update. I think that they said that we'll be able to just plug in multiple values for things that we want to craft. So. That's great, um, but you know stuff like craft from containers, for instance, is like. I understand that there's someone on their team, who's probably an evil madman like I am, who's just like evilly grinning because everybody that plays Valheim is forced to actually know where everything is and have it in their inventory before they build. But it's like that's probably the number one thing that is hated by most players that play survival games. So it's like to me, there's there's some really obvious, very simple quality of life improvements that, like I I can't see I can't see the the impression from the gaming community being anything other yeah, than favorable. I, 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 I agree, implement. especially with the crafting from containers in particular. And it's funny you say that because I remember the the one specific interview, and they they said that they felt that that was part of the gameplay experience, and I was like ah. I don't like that part of yeah. the gameplay experience. Oh. <laughs> I, I under, yeah, I understand that, but it's like, okay, for someone who's complaining about there not being enough longevity in my games, I understand that I'm being a hypocrite here. But there's other ways to create longevity than forcing me to go through all of my bags constantly. Yeah, that's that's one of the things we target on Palm. I played in Shrouded for about a week, and then I just never went back to it. Not because it isn't an incredibly beautiful survival crafting game, because it really is, but simply because I got so infuriated at the at, at just the, the storage chest system in the game. They're small, they're hard to target, there's no crafting from containers. I just put it down, and I just picked up Valheim again, and I haven't been back. Yeah. I mean, that's it, how it, it is once the, you have a game you're satisfied by. You just keep going back to it, you know? But it, it, you sort of need those experiences with those other games. And it can help or you be like... Or annoy you by not crafting from containers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's see. So, so I'll, I'll share one, one more thing with you. Because it helps with the, the longevity thing. It's funny, actually. A lot of the things you've been talking about are things I'm tackling right now on the Path of Magic project. So I'm basically making... Okay. It's not just me. It's like I, I'm the script person who decides the things, of course. But I'm working with the people who play on the server already. And we're making this thing called Path of Magic. So basically, um, it's all with Expand World Prefab. So it's like a mod you put on the server, and then it makes Valheim's mechanics all change. So then you can play Valheim without any mods, or your quality of life mods, or whatever you want, on that server, 
and then you have a fundamentally different Valheim experience. And basically, trying to set it up so that it's more like an MMO, more like what you're saying. And the thing I've mm -hmm. realized yes, is that is doing that on his server as well. He's created like a fully, uh, like what he's done is truly impressive because he's got custom audio, and in his quests and who, everything. Who again? Sorry. Stone Prophet. Ah yes, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I, I just didn't hear the name. Yes, the the, the prophet. He is. Uh, he's one of the guys I, I always come back to. His videos have been very useful in my journey for creating crazy modded worlds. Yeah, it, I, I was. It was a pleasure speaking with him as well. Um, but so, what I was getting at is that there's there's these accidental discoveries that we've made on Palm, and I can't even say they were my ideas. Sometimes they are, but. Oftentimes, I'll, let's say I p implement a hundred things. Um, so like randomly generated locations? No, like you literally change mechanics. So the way Expand World Prefabs works is you make the game react to things that happen by doing things that can already happen, but not in that situation. So like every time you oh, kill a wolf, okay. it heals all your health. You could do that. Every time you oh, yeah. get in a boat and you crash it, it repairs itself, it's like of, these it's, kind of it's things. Kind of like, yeah, it's kind of like wacky database for the mechanics of the game. Ye, sort of, yeah, yeah. For, specifically for the prefabs, that's why it's called expand world prefabs. Um, mm -hmm. But basically, and so there's there's two things I've come across on Palm that I'll share with you because it might help you with your notion of trying to keep people preserved in the world longer. Um, mm -hmm. So the first the first thing is easier to wrap ones head around um, and it has to do with bosses so basically one of the reasons players lose progress or they lose immersion in Valheim is because they're able to kill bosses so th this sounds counterintuitive why would you make it so players can't kill bosses that doesn't make sense from a logical perspective but in practice imagine that instead of you kill the boss at the end of each biome Imagine that you actually progressed out of the biome in another way. I won't elaborate on how, but you can get that biome progression item in another way. You don't kill the boss. Instead, you can't even kill the boss because they're so incredibly powerful that your only chance is progressing later into the game, getting lots of strong range gear, magic, power. and then coming back to then be able to kill the boss. So, so what happens with Fader? <laughs> Well, that's the thing. Ideally, he's so hard that players try to kill him using different strategies and mechanisms. And this is the thing that it's kind of abstract. It's hard, it's hard to... Um, like, from the player's perspective, when, you hear, when they hear you talking about this way, they don't like it. But I've seen that when they actually play, they, they do like it. Um, no, so yeah, I, I know, I know, what, I understand what you're saying because, like, one of the thing, one of the early problems that I discovered in with a lot of the modded servers is that take South Sills armors for instance. Um, the early game buffs of the armors are pretty are pretty tame, but the late game stuff is just so overpowered that by the time that you get to Mistlands, nothing is a challenge anymore. Like even defeating the queen is like a five second fight. Um, so yeah, I, one of the things that I've definitely noticed is that when you crank up the difficulty of the game, it is counterintuitive, right? You think if I make the game so much more difficult, people aren't going to want to play it. But, you know, yeah, honestly, a better... Like, if it's done it's the wrong way, way, then that does happen. Like, you can't but, just but, but, crank like, up the numbers, if that makes sense. Project Zomboid is a perfect example of how actually you can hook people in with difficulty. You can make a game so difficult, you can make survival so hard that every 15 minutes that you don't die feels like an amazing victory. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so so you're actually, so it's like that's the high that the, that the players are living off of, not the high of downing content. It's the high of just realizing that everything can kill me in one shot and I'm the man, nothing's killed me. Yeah. Yeah, that kind of feeling. And, and, and to, mm -hmm. to apply it to this situation with the bosses, the idea is not necessarily to make everything in the Valheim experience itself grueling. It's to redo the boss experience so that bosses improve the gameplay loop instead of creating a gameplay loop that results in players leaving. Because ultimately, the way it works now, they kill a boss and leave. 
Yeah, that, that's a better solution than what a lot of other mods try to put in. Like, uh, uh, like one solution that, like, uh, for instance, the trophies mod does is that, well, if you keep killing Ikethir, you can just eat the trophies and up your stats that way. The problem is that that gets really boring, and then by the time that you've killed Elder, you can kill Ikethir in, like, two minutes, so you just farm him over and over and over again and create an overpowered character. Yeah. Yeah, and this so so in this system, it's the okay, the reason that the most challenging part by far is balancing these systems because you have to it's a lot harder than normal things to balance because you're going to be under a lot of pressure from the playtesters to make it easier, but you have to know when that that won't serve the greater purpose and that's very challenging. But it it appears that the ideal is that they they need to have an experience it's so hard they think it it's impossible but then they get stronger and they start having doubts about whether it was really impossible and then they go back and try again and there's a noticeable improvement but they still fail and without having wasted too much of their time that's the the balance that last part not wasting too much of their time that part's really important so you have to figure out how you can make it so each attempt only takes like 10 minutes and then it's over and if they didn't do it by then it's done that part without that timer people so they the way players play plays themselves into frustration and the group dynamic gets really frustrated as well so by just having a simple timer you make it so that it ends and then they have to talk to each other and it's like low stress again and if they didn't work they could try again but it's not going to take hours, you know? <laughs> yeah, they could set it up. It's, it's actually funny that you say that because uh, one of my early modding experiences was I like, created a modded server for me and like three friends. And it took us two hours to kill a five star regenerating bone mass. <laughs> yeah. It was not. It, it, it was. It was a funny, intense battle and the kind of thing that I wish somebody was recording because it literally took us two hours, but we eventually took them down. But it's like, yeah, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That was one of the funnest experiences that we had, that, I, that I ever had playing the game. And, you know, going back and thinking about it, I was like, yeah, you, you couldn't have done it with a group smaller than ours because he's just healing too fast. And, and that was, and that experience has stuck with me. That was a very early Valheim experience. Like, I still see it very clearly in my head. So, yeah, I think... Um, difficulty for all people involved in both making games and modding games is is one of those things that can really fall to the wayside if you're not thinking about it actively like if you're so focused on i want to do this cool thing or i want to throw in this cool armor i want to do this that you lose focus when it comes to the game balance it's like well if i can one shot everything it's not fun yeah realistically every single change has to be play tested to see if it has interactions with other things that you didn't account for and it's like that's that's intense and to to, to to add to go on yeah most games have like a hard mode to them for a reason yeah and like people will play the hard modes to and die over and over and over again just for the clout just to say that they that they beat the game yeah yeah for for me it's kind of a it's a it's a it's a different appeal because the so palm is a very hard no map no portal server but the reason for that is because when it comes to making a more mmo like experience to making a world that feels more consistently alive you you have to deal with um things in the long run so it's a lot easier if things are much more powerful and the players can't just teleport everywhere and move around very quickly it's i I actually wish I actually wish that they actually didn't put portals in Vanilla Valheim. I think uh, I, I, I'm with you. I think I think portals is one of the things that makes the game too easy, and, uh, and but unfortunately, it's it, it's hard to get a lot of people into it because it is a part of the vanilla game. So it's like if you yeah. if you take stuff away, pe- it, it it makes it makes us like people don't like that. They don't like the idea of you taking exactly. stuff away. from it's part them. of their identity of Valheim. Yeah, it's, it's it's like yeah. I would love to play on your server just to see j- just for the grind of the no portal experience because I because I would enjoy that. But I think well, it's, it's not really. Um, th- that's the thing about Palm is that it has so many things set up because it's not like it's made to be a long lasting server that, like I mentioned, different play groups come and add things. So uh-huh. 
basically there's these paths, these main, main paths, and you can walk on a path from the start all the way. Eventually you'd get to the Ashlands and like go through the entire Ashlands and then it ends at Fader's spawn. But in order to <laughs> do that on no map, no portal mode, like even if you just tried to run, you'd get killed by something. You wouldn't be able to make it anywhere. Like you'd get killed in the plains yeah. somewhere way before, way, way before getting there. But without, I, I will say that the, the no portal, no map experience alone, I, I wouldn't, I, it, it, it can be a fun thing to try, but I wouldn't necessarily recommend it to everybody. Whereas if you are on a server with other people, the no map, no portal experience can be really incredible because it adds a lot of depth and it makes it so that there's a lot more incentive to build and do things communally and make paths so you don't get lost. And I find that the, the no portal, no map experience really shines with the multiplayer, but I guess that's just Valheim in general, isn't it? Well, I'm almost done putting together all my new server settings. So until 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 this uh, new Witches update comes, I have no reason not to hop into that world because it sounds like fun. Yeah, you're welcome to. Really, anybody, um, I mean, the people watching on YouTube, so they, they know how to access it, but I, I talk about it in the end of the video, so it's a convenience filter. Basically, I found out that I can have a public Valheim server that anybody can join without having griefing issues. The thing is, it can't be easily listed and accessible anywhere. So it can't be like you can just, without, like someone watching this, they have basically passed the filter because they're, they've put the inconvenience in of listening to the video to this point, right? Or someone who's interacted with me. That so they're one of us. They're not someone who's going to troll or come in and do a bunch of damage. Yeah, exactly. And I found that that simple act, like the, if you take your server and you list it publicly in Discord and in the Valheim group and people can join it without interacting with you in any way whatsoever, you're going to have problems with griefers. But if you have your server up in a way where people have to spend five or 10 minutes figuring out where to go and then to go here and then do this thing, you're going to have a much better experience with your players. It's that simple. You just I have earned to that, man. filter them a little bit. Yeah, I actually earned that in the early days when I had my own V Rising server. And I learned very quickly that uh, just posting on Reddit and letting anybody in was a bad idea. <laughs> yes, yeah, exactly. But uh, um, so... So if you, I'll send you the link to join, and also anyone, anyone watching, sure. um, you can just look in. You're looking for like a, a link in one of the previous videos to the poolside Discord server, and then that'll have the server info, and then you can get all the Discord stuff and everything. But uh, I'll just make one more thing that might be relevant to what you're doing with the long, the long term thing. Um, I mentioned that there's a second system because this boss system is just one thing that we redid on Palm, and now there's been enough playtesting to see that it does, this notion of most, having the bosses be out of reach for the players, it does seem to work. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it does seem to work better than having the bosses be the progression of each biome. So I'll just leave that at that, but then I'll move on to the next thing. And the second thing, this was a really shocking one. We made just this little feature, didn't really think much about it, and it turned everything in the game into an item sink which is really relevant to valheim because it's a game where normally you only make everything once but this one mm -hmm. change did so many different things and so I'll, I'll quickly explain how it works we added this this blacksmithing dverger right you basically you can summon these dverger and then depending on where they summoned they do different things it might be a trader it might be like a fishmonger you can sell fish to all, all sorts of different stuff but for now, we'll just focus on the Dverger that you summon, who is a blacksmith, meaning he was a Dverger summoned right next to a forge. So when that happens, he has three services that he can do. Doesn't really matter all the details. I'll just tell you about the one service that changed everything called empowering. And basically, you can give your weapon, any weapon in the game, any armor in the game, to the Diverger. So you have to throw it on the floor so the server can access it. And then the moment you do that, you pay with a silver chest, a treasure chest. So it's a sink for two silver necklaces, rubies, and coins. And then what the blacksmith does is he basically flips a coin. And if it's heads, your weapon's level doubles. 
like jesus so, yeah exactly so if it's level eight it becomes 16 that means all this of your stats get scaled up a bunch and right okay so i won't i won't get into what actually so happened is yet. this is your train in cause of doom is he like mithra infusing your weapon jesus yeah right and it, it sounds and that's the funny thing is like i am I'm, I'm with you at first i was like okay this seems su- stupid op of course players are just going to end up with crazy powerful weapons and I'm going to have to deal with that. But here's the other part. So I said 50% of the time because the other half the time the weapon gets totally destroyed and you'd have to remake it. And so this begs the question, well, why would someone throw their weapon down when they know that they might lose it and have to remake it from scratch? Well... Because it's so fucking powerful. Well, have, it have, you, have you never gambled? <laughs> I'm like, have you never gambled before? Exactly. Uh, and dude, it, what's it seems so, to, it to be very effective on humans. Yes, and what's so hilarious was this one update pretty much liquidated players' inventories and made it so they used up loads of available resources. They got rid of like a bunch of extra weapons, and it created a circumstance where people still don't have the most powerful weapons because they keep losing them because you need the basically i set up this system so that if you get to level if you get past a certain level it gives you a warning and then if you try again it just automatically destroys it so the maximum is like level 96 or something stupid and like if you actually use level 96 gear it's crazy powerful like you can even take a fine wood bow and level it up to level 96 and then start actually using it in like the Ashlands and, and that kind of thing. Well, see, my, my brain is immediately going, okay, how do I take everything you just said and implement it into my server and turn the Dervagers into dwarves instead? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, like that's my brain. Or, or how do I create an Elven Smith that does that as well? Like, like how, how do I take what you've done and just like multiply it exponentially for all the cool fantasy stuff that I do? And it's just like, this is why I love the Valheim modding community. Every time that someone introduces a new mod, that's essentially what they're doing. They're creating opportunities for people like me to just go crazy with it and get really complicated. And I'm like, see, now I have the idea in my head and I can't get it out. And now I'm probably just going to dissect the crap out of your server to figure out how to implement it for myself. Oh, yeah, you're, you're welcome to. And I'm very public about things. So everything I'm working on on the server is in like a Discord chat in the group and players ask for stuff, and I work on player features and these things. Um, but that, it's actually quite a simple, like, a data change. No, I'll just send it to you. Uh, it's like four lines. That, that's what's crazy about this. These experiences, that, that, that th- these experiences have shown me that, like, it's easy to spend, like, hundreds of hours, let's say, working on something. But there are things that you can change about Valheim where you only have to write or script, like... 10 lines and it so alters the gameplay experience like like the thing i just like i just mentioned it's just a really simple mathematics equation it looks at the current level and then it doubles it and gives it back and if it failed the roll it then destroys it before the player can loot it that's very very simple but it has profound I have a ridiculous amount of black metal at the end of every game yeah i don't know what to do with now yeah, i do on, on Palm, we have it. So the Diverger trade, they act as an item sink. So all of the things that you have an oversupply of, I've gone through and identified which things get oversupplied and then tied it to an item that is in higher demand but undersupplied. So, for example, on Palm, let's say you get uh, you have loads of black metal because everyone always has loads of black metal. That's a normal Valheim thing. So then you take that and you throw it to the Dverger trader and it can be any Dverger in the game. It doesn't have to be that specific one. So it gives you a reason to go find and interact with the Dverger. And then let's say you have 30 black metal. You toss it on the ground next to him and immediately it's swapped for 15 iron. So there's all these predetermined kinds of trades. Like, for example, you could throw down... um, like 920 coins near a Dverger or whatever, and then get a pile of yug, yug shoots or something like that. It, it all depends on, on the circumstance, and the players need to know them ahead of time. 
Um, but that's all really easy stuff to do with EWP. And the, the point I was just getting at is that with the blacksmithing thing, um, it opens up, the, and this is the, the consequences I learned about, because this, this is a system I implemented like, I don't know, two weeks ago or something. And it relates so well to that boss thing. Because remember what I was mentioning about the bosses being really challenging, and I found that the sweet spot is when you actually try to make the bosses impossible to kill, but technically possible. Because then the players keep trying and they find ways to do it, and then you can just sort of adjust the boss based on what they did. But you make a game out of the players trying to kill the boss. And that makes a loop of some kind that helps keep things more immersive for longer. Because it also solves this other issue where like when you have a boss of a game, what the hell do they drop that feels good? Newt, weapons, armor. Yeah, but they're the, the boss. Once you've killed them, you have done the hardest possible thing in the game. So like, oh, I you see, see what I'm saying? Like, how do you make it so the loot feels valuable? And my theory is you can't. And so the actual more effective thing to do is to push the boss fight experience out of player's reach, but do it in a way where they enjoy trying and they think it's possible. That's the, that's the basics that or, of it. Either that or do it the classic, uh, the, the classic MMO method. You make the boss really, really hard, and then you give it like a less than 1% chance of spawning the gear that you really want it to spawn, so you and your friends have to try and murder it every single week over and over again. <laughs> yeah, but then people don't enjoy it, and that, that's, the, that's yeah. the, the part. You have to figure out how to make it so the act of trying and failing is, is inherently fun. fun. Exactly. And that's the, that, that's the trick. And it, it's not something like, okay, this is how I'm dealing with it with Palm, but I've like basically made it so I'm going to work on all the other stuff of Palm and then take a break and actually play through myself and then focus entirely on making a bunch of really fun end game boss fights for every boss. So like end game eke their fight, you know, really challenging. You have to learn the mechanics. You have to try over and over and over again, even with magic to, to, to be able to kill him fast enough before the timer goes out. Um, these sort of things are sort of really important to that, that long, it, it gives it this like, because if you can keep the fighters on the server, the builders stay. If you can keep people active, the other people stay. So you, you sort of need a, a loop for them <laughs> where they can progress mm -hmm. without, um, without like, you know, getting bored or getting too powerful. And that, that, that's where the, the systems tie into each other. Because when you can get level 96 weapons and stuff, it means that instead of making your favorite weapon once or twice, you can make eight of them to try and get enough materials to get that success, to get the max level of that version of your favorite weapon. And it doesn't matter that it's from the previous biomes because it's so powerful that it, it, it doesn't, it doesn't really matter. But as you mentioned with, with uh, difficulty in these things, like the reason I can do this on Palm is because Palm is a, a pretty much a one hit, one kill life. So most monsters on Palm will kill you in one hit unless you have a shield, like a magical shield or something up. You die really quickly. So you being able to kill stuff quickly doesn't mean you can't die. And that makes it work. Like you have to always be able to die if you're not paying attention, no matter how powerful your I mean, weapons are it really does sound like you've cranked up valheim's difficulty to projects on board levels <laughs> well in, in some ways because in other ways it's it's a lot easier on palm like for example you don't lose any like i turned all the experience loss off uh i, I haven't figured out how to not so it doesn't lose your level but you still reset to zero ex skill if that makes sense I, I wasn't able to get rid of that yet but aside from that, death, like the idea is that dying should be a fun experience. It should be something that is enjoyable and interesting. This notion that dying is something we need to punish players for, I think is an archaic thing. That it's a notion we cling on to, but it holds us back. Really, we should make dying incredibly fun so that then players, like they yeah, die yeah. and they want to share their stories about yeah, dying. I, I agree. I, I, like the, I actually do like the classic MMO 
um, system for when you die, which is really just you take a bunch of durability, right? So it's like that's the cost of dying. It's the cost of of, of essentially like of, of repairing your stuff, which I mean to me is that's that the a really cost, simple. or is the cost going back to your body? Or I guess it's both, right? Really, it's not one. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I, I agree. Like I hate corp runs. So like from. I've always wanted to kind of run a game where, where like my armor stays on me afterwards because you can very easily do that with uh, with mods, but I haven't done it because other players want to. But Even I'm with world, you. That, that's how Palm works. You keep all your yeah, armor. Yeah. You just lose your inventory, but you keep yeah. your equipped I mean, armor. And exactly. I love it. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, I mean, and, and that and that makes. That makes a lot of sense, and that's honestly the way that I wish Valheim was, because it really is a kick in the, uh, uh, you know, to, to the old balls. When you're sitting there, you've got like a bow skill of 70, and then you die to something really dumb, and your bow skill's down to 60. And it's like, dude, do you have any idea how long it takes to go from 60 to 70? <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 uh, in, in my head, well, skill systems are, uh, they're a cheap form of game development because you can yeah. put a skill system in a game and it's going to give an artificial feeling of progression to certain kinds of players. But really, you want that skill system to function without being forced by mathematics. Like you want your game to work in a way where the player actually gets better because they've been playing and they are better as a player not like that character got stronger but because it's a lot harder <laughs> to develop that way as developers we tend to make these artificial skill systems where like no it doesn't matter if you're paying attention or not you kill this one thing you get this much experience you level at this point it has nothing to do with your learning in any way whatsoever it just happens to correlate with the fact that the more you've developed your skills the more likely you've gotten into the experience where you learn something but really, a good game doesn't need a skill system. It just needs to be constantly checking players' skills through gameplay. And then skilled players are able to stay alive and do damage and do the thing. So, But again, this isn't to criticize Valheim. This is just to say yeah, that... No, the, 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 only thing that I would, the only thing that I would push back on that is that that's going to work for like a specific niche of characters. But you know, especially whenever I hear the the, the, the characters that are skilled thing, really what I really what I, what harkens that harkens back to is a lot of you know the the toxic PvPers because that's how they think and that's how they talk. And the truth is that you know that that's a subsection of gamers. You know, you have you have gamers that that are in it for the skill because they want to get better, uh, but then you also have gamers that just want to have like an enjoyable character character leveling process. Uh, yeah, so, but, I, so when I use the I, word I, I skill, that's not what I'm talking about. So I'm, I'm talking about their, their, their ability to do something, not necessarily something measured by others. But like, for example, the builders on my server that I mentioned earlier, like they're, they're really skilled builders. They're able to build things that are really beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, and they can do it quite quickly, and they can organize things really well. They're very skilled in those things. Yeah, uh, those are. Do you, you see what I'm saying? Those are actual yeah. skills created by gameplay. Uh, yeah. That's what I'm uh, getting yeah. at. And so when we make yeah. these artificial systems, it doesn't actually catch the actual experience. There is, and, but it's trying to. It's trying to create that illusion, right? And all, all I'm suggesting is that there's better mm -hmm. ways to do it than just having a numerical value. But it's again, it's a it's a degree of complexity. And you can't really know how things are going to work unless you're developing while playtesting. Because otherwise, it's just so easy to think players are going to do one thing and then the reality is they don't give a shit. They do something else. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, so many times that I have unfortunately discovered that players did not give a flying F about what I was doing. <laughs> it's, uh, it, 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 it's a real gut check. But honestly, the, anyone that wants to either mod or get into game development needs to have those experiences. Because... Ultimately, it's about getting other people to play the thing that you've created. You know, creating a thing that, you know, so you can navel gaze and be like, oh my god, I created the best game ever and no one ever plays it. That makes that might make you feel good for about five minutes, but I, I think realistically, the 
people like us do this because we're truly passionate about it and we want other people to have those positive gaming experiences. We want them to come back to us and tell us we want more of this. Because that's really, at least personally, that's what fuels me more than anything. I, I was ready to scuttle my uh, NPCs mod about a month or two ago just because something broke and I was just kind of fed up with like fixing it. But then the moment that I deprecated my mod, I had like 10 different people reach out to me on my server or, or personally and they were like, no, we need your mod. We love your mod. Like, please fix it. And and if those people hadn't have reached out to me and said, we love your work, it would still be deprecated and I would have never come, and I would have never gone back to it. Before, before we end the call, can I just make it very clear to anyone watching where they can go to connect with you? Absolutely. They can uh, reach me at my Discord server. I've uh, I've given you my uh, my server. I, I hope that you plug it into the video. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm pretty. I work from home, and my Discord's always up. So I'm in there. Uh, I'm in one of the channels always. Uh, anybody that wants to reach out to me, either for modding ideas or that wants to uh, wants to help with the server, wants to play on the server, whatever it is, uh, they they can reach out to me there. Whatever. Awesome. All right, thanks for watching, everybody.